Shabbat Shalom. So today is Shabbat Agadol, which is the, the Shabbat right before Pesach. And traditionally, the rabbi, this was actually one of only two times in the year where the rabbi would give a sermon. Where the rest of the time, no sermon. Don't go find those shuls. <laughs> and on Shabbat Agadol, the rabbi would give a sermon and it could last the entire afternoon. So just get comfortable. <laughs> and uh, we tell Carrie to keep Kiddush uh, open late. No, today, friends, not, not that long, except we are going to start with perhaps the weirdest thing that the Torah has to offer, and we're going to end with something imminently practical. Okay? So get ready. Now you've, you've been signposted, or whatever my educator wife would tell me, what's the right thing here? No, just she says move on. Okay. <laughs> so, what's the weirdest thing that the Torah has to offer in this week's Parsha? Anyone? Take a guess. People are reading along. It's bizarre. It's odd. I've never seen it before. What is it? Yes, thank you. It's house leprosy. What? <laughs> Apparently, the, your house can get uh, some kind of, uh, basically the same thing as a leprous skin affliction, but on the walls of your house, according to the Torah. And so the Torah tries to tell us what we should do in that horrific event that we find leprosy on our walls. Obviously, you go to the priest. The priest. Yeah, of course. If you have leprosy on your walls, please go to Ken, not <laughs> to the rabbi. But there are different opinions as to what's actually happening with this house leprosy thing, right? Raise your hand if you've ever seen house leprosy. No, Ken, really? Please tell me he's not here. No? Okay. Um, mold. So, okay, I heard someone say, now, that is one of the commentaries sort of says that there is some kind of fungus that can grow on the, like the stone in your walls and if you don't take care of it, it will eventually look like a sort of leprous skin affliction. And as a new homeowner, I really didn't need to Google that. Uh, but apparently that is a thing that can happen. But for the rabbis, that's not a good enough answer, of course, as to why this is happening. So the Malbim points out that the word in the verse that we, that we have here, when we enter the land of Canaan and I give you as a possession and I inflict an eruptive plague upon the house that's in your land, right? The, the word that, is, that God says is venatati nega, I will give you a plague. Tzarad bevet eretz echuzatem techem. The word natati, says Malabim, always, whenever it's used by God, the word to give, natan, right? Always means a good thing. Natan only comes to mean something with a positive outcome. Therefore, house leprosy has to be good in some way. So how could it be good? And then some of our commentaries end. So, so Malbim says it's sort of good because it's another reason to tell you to repent your sins. Right? If someone has sinned, then they get a little leprosy on their skin. And if they still don't repent, then they get a lepr little leprosy on their clothes, which we write about today also. And if they still don't repent, leprosy on your house. And so actually, this is a good thing because it's a warning sign, right? They've got to repent quickly, otherwise, house leprosy. The Midrash goes a step further and says it's a good thing because it gives a person privacy while they do teshuva. Because what's one place you are not going to follow anyone into, no matter how mad you are at them or what you need from them? The house leprosy place, right? <laughs> and so if that happens, it's sort of God's way of ensuring that the, that the individual is undisturbed and they're not further embarrassed by whatever is going on and they can do tshuva and then come out of their home uh, a cleansed individual. Rashi... And this might be one of my favorite Rashi's of all time. So I'm actually going to read part of it for you. So Rashi says that when God made this announcement about the plagues, it's because the Amorites, who were in the land before the Israelites got there, the Amorites concealed golden treasure in the walls of their houses 
during the whole 40 years that the Israelites were in the wilderness to hide them from the Israelites when they would eventually come back to their homes. And so God gave house leprosy to the Jews so that they would clean it, open up the walls, and find hidden treasure. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, if, first of all, if you have mold in your walls, you should clean it. And if you find golden treasure, uh, come donate to the shul. But, <laughs> but what's happening with these three different answers? Right? We're taking something so odd, so bizarre, that actually the rabbis were, are about to say, this never ever happened. But this ritual of having a weird thing on your house, going to the priest, having to clean and make amends in some way, is meant to serve a function in some way. Right? It's meant to either be a guardrail to remind us to do tshuva. It's meant to be a reminder to everyone else to leave this person alone while they do tshuva. Or, and this is my interpretation of the golden treasure Rashi, and you can have your own, and I'd like to hear it. It's saying that there's something magical in our world, and the weird things that happen that we don't explain might have buried treasure behind them. And so you should engage in the sort of symbols, and you should engage in these rituals, because you never know what you're going to find in the walls of your house if you do. So the Babylonian Talmud about this same thing says there never has been and never will be house leprosy. It's not a real thing. <laughs> so, says the rabbis in the Talmud, why is it in the Torah? Why do we talk about it? Anyone want to offer? What do you think the Talmud's going to say? Why do we have this thing that never happened, never will happen, but we read about it? Why? I'm hearing mumbling that I'm just going to imagine is the right answer, which is so that people will ask questions and learn Torah and engage in Torah study. Now, what does that sound like to you? The Seder that we're about to do, exactly. Now, this is sort of the rabbi's answer for anything that they don't understand, right? It's not a real thing. I don't know why is it there. Ah, so you'll all engage in Torah study. Shabbat Shalom, let's go to Kiddush. But it does clue us into the Seder precisely. Because we have all of these rituals that we do in the Seder that are the exact same thing. We don't really know why we do it. Why is there an extra hand washing without a blessing? So that the children will ask. Why do you tell Magid in weird ways? So that the children will ask. Why do you do all these things? So that, so that people will ask questions and they'll engage in this discussion. And the Passover Seder is sort of the key that gives away the rest of the game of the Jewish calendar and Judaism basically in general. Now, according to the rabbis, this is the first holiday. And throughout the year, we have holidays full of weird rituals and symbols, and there's a lot of hidden meaning in them. And on Pesach, we say the quiet part out loud, right? We hold up the matzah and we say, this is the bread of affliction. It's meant to remind us of, right? We're, get, we're reading the stage directions, literally, right? For when we come to the Haggadah to teach people what the rest of Judaism is going to be about, okay? On Pesach, you say motzi, matzah, maror, and these symbols each mean a certain thing. And if you've just mentioned them, that's enough. And if you give meaning, that's good. And if you give lots of meaning, that's even better, Right? And you know then, for the rest of the year, when you are fasting in the summer and you don't quite know why, when you're reading Eicha, when you're holding weird leafy palm fronds and circling around the room shouting, save us, save us, save us, that's Sukkot Hoshan Rabbah, that you, you're meant to do the same thing that we do on Pesach and ask questions and say, why is this? And give meaning to it. And I think I've said this before again and again, but this is the genius of the rabbis and of rabbinic Judaism, that we code our values into these symbols and rituals. We code our experiences into these symbols and rituals. And the rituals come to do a few different things for us. Rituals are an easy way to pass on our values and our beliefs and our history to the next generation. Right? I can hand you a book to read about the Jews in Egypt, or I can say, eat this bitter herb. Right? One of those is much easier to get kids to do, uh, and then, then to explain why you just did it, than to try to you know, invite everyone to a history lecture, um, although for some of us that'd be fun. But one of the reasons is about education. 
Another reason for our rituals is about reminding us of power that we have and creating a world that we completely control. I've quoted this book before. I will quote it again. I'm going to quote it right now. There's a book called Ritual and Its Consequences. It's about, it's, it's four different professors write about what ritual can do, and they say it's meant to create a, I'll explain in a second, I promise. It's meant to create a subjunctive world that we're in control of. So Shabbat and the rituals of Shabbat create a world as if we didn't have to do any labor. Right? As if it was like that. And it's not, but it, for these 26 hours, it's as if it were. Right? Pesach is meant to create a world as if we are all wealthy people who can just hang out and have this dinner together where we talk about our history and our values and pass the wine and isn't this wonderful. We are creating this world through the rituals that we do. And finally, rituals help us express emotions and beliefs and ideas that we couldn't put words to. Either we can't put words to them because the emotions are too raw. Thinking, I'm thinking right now of many of our mourning rituals that we have to do. Or because we don't really know how to explain the theology behind it, so we're just going to do the ritual and we're going to let that speak for ourselves. I think of, I don't know, prayer. I think of other things in that. So all of the rituals that we have on the Passover Seder that we're going to read about and sing about and point out and put on our table, each one of them comes to do all of these things. It reminds us of some sort of power that we have. The ability to make the world holy. The Paschal Lamb, right? The shank bone. Our ability to affect the world around us and make it a holy place. We can take something that's from this world, we can bring it to God's world. No one else can do that. We have that power. That's what the little thing that's been sitting in your freezer all year is meant to remind you of. And we could go through all of the symbols of the Seder, and we're not going to do it right now, but you're all going to do it in a couple of days, and then you'll report back how it went. But the other thing that's beautiful about these rituals is that they can change, and they can grow, and they can adapt. Right? The one that I think of all the time are the ritual of the four questions. Right? Though if you look at the Mishnah and the four questions, one of them is about uh, why on this night we eat only roasted meat, and on all other nights we eat uh, meat cooked however we want, right? That's not in your Haggadah. Because over the years, that question becomes less relevant to the realia of the people around them who are not eating only roasted meat at the Seder and eat meat other ways. And the thing that was totally normal in the Mishnah's time, which is that everyone ate every dinner reclining all the time because that's how the Romans used to do it, becomes weirder and weirder as we hold it as a ritual into the Middle Ages. So we switch out the question about the roasted meat for the question about reclining. Why on this night do we recline and all other nights we don't? The rituals can change and adapt because our world changes and adapts and we have new things we need to express and new things we need to say. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever had or seen an orange on the Seder plate. Nice, right? That's a new ritual that has been brought into the world. By the way, it's uh, in a sort of apocryphal thing. What's the story that we all have heard? Why is the orange on the Seder plate? Right? Because some Orthodox rabbi yelled at Susanna Heschel and said, a woman on the bima is like an orange on the Seder plate, right? Never happened! <laughs> that never happened. She's written about it. That never happened. What happened was that she was at Oberlin College. Hey. That she was at... <laughs> That's, this is why I know the story. She, not when I was there, she was at Oberlin College and she read in a book that the students at Oberlin had put together a story of a, of a woman asking an Orthodox rabbi about the place of LGBTQ plus people in the Jewish world and he said that that's like having bread on the Seder plate. And so Susanna Heschel, not wanting people to trafe their homes on Pesach with bread on the Seder plate, adapted it and added this orange to show that our people are more fruitful when we're inclusive of everyone, including LGBTQ plus people. Right? Now, I don't really matter. It doesn't really matter which story you take and why you put the orange on the Seder plate. That's the entire point, is that these rituals come to have many things coded inside of them, and we can grow and change them as we want to. And so, friends, we're thinking about, in thinking about this year, 
and the seders that we're going to have. It has been quite a year for the Jewish people. There is a lot that has gone on. There is a lot that is still going on. And we can't have a Seder this year like we had last year, or the year before, or the year before that. There is something amazingly comforting and beautiful about doing the same thing again and again and again. It gives us uh, a lot. And I'm not saying we should undo the Seder completely. I'm not saying we don't sing. I'm not saying we don't have four glasses of wine. We don't do all the joyous things. Of course we should do those. But I would encourage you this year to add something to your Seder plate. Add some ritual. Add some symbol that brings in what you think you need or your family needs or your Seder needs to be thinking about at your tables this year. I'm going to give you three options from other people that are smarter than I that have written about this, and you can decide if you want those or not. We had um, earlier this week, uh, uh, I want to make sure I get it right, um, earlier this week, Rabbi Eli Confer uh, wrote about uh, having two matzot instead of three. Um, give me a second, I'll explain it, but it's quite meaningful. So in the, mi- in the middle of the plate, right, you've got the little stack of matzahs. Before you break the afikoman, how many do you have there? Three, exactly. Then yachat, you take the middle matzah. Now, from the Talmud through the Middle Ages, there were two, just two uh, matzot there. And then you would, end, so once you do yachat, you break it, you hide the afikomen, and then you're left for the rest of the Seder with one and a half matzahs. And one and a half matzahs is significant because how many loaves of bread are you supposed to have on every holiday? Two. So it was meant in its day, and this is all in the Talmud, it was meant in its day to remind us again of the affliction of our ancestors in Egypt that they didn't have a full two chalas on the festival. And neither did we. And then somewhere around the Middle Ages, basically the Jewish people, a little more removed from that, also a little bit wealthier, wanted to have two matzot left over, like the holidays, where they wanted the Passover Seder to remember a holiday, to resemble more of the festival holidays. So they added a matzah. So you have three matzot, you break one, you hide the afikomen for the kids to go find and get their $2 bills, and then you have two matzahs and a half left over to celebrate with. So Rabbi Confer says, maybe this year, let's go back to the earlier custom. And he says, just for this year, Please, God, next year we will live in a world where we're back to three matzot, and we can eat that in joy and in peace. But for this year, maybe we do only two, and we sit for the rest of our Seder with one and a half matzahs, because there are still 130 people in captivity. How could we have a full table with that? There's still people dying. There's still a lot of fear and scaredness in the world, and so we should lessen our joy, and it's okay if it doesn't resemble a normal festival. Rabbanit Leasarna, uh, who, uh, whose kids go to our nursery school, uh, and is here. She writes uh, a suggestion that people should put a mirror uh, on their tables, on the Seder tables this year, um, to force us to think about the unique suffering um, that women have undergone this year and throughout our history. Um, I can explain to you uh, what the mirror, why, why the mirror and what it has to do with it. And her article is actually great, um, and we can ha- make that available to anyone. Uh, it has to do with how the Israelite women um, helped keep the Jewish people alive, literally, uh, in Egypt during slavery. But in her own words, it's not a family-friendly story. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, but her suggestion of placing a mirror, a small mirror on your Seder plate, on your, on your Pesach table in honor of or thinking about women and all that women have undergone horrifically this year. I know that I will be adding uh, something for in our, in our Seder table this year. Aaron, I didn't tell you this, but we're doing it. Uh, <laughs> I will be adding this year, um, we're going to be removing extra wine from our wine glasses for all the Palestinians who are dying in Gaza. I think that this is something incredibly important for us to do. We mourn the death of the Egyptian soldiers, and they were the ones actually trying to kill us. We fast in solidarity with the firstborn Egyptians. Uh, We look for the righteous uh, everywhere that we go. We look for and mourn that, and so we should remove some of the glass of joy from our cup 
Um, I'm going to take six drops, uh, one for each month that this has been going on this year, um, because surely um, we can add to the long tradition of our ancestors that as we acknowledge not only the pain that our people have endured, we in acknowledge the pain that our people have caused as well. And this is one of the beautiful things about a Seder table. It's big. It can hold a lot of different symbols. Looking at a Seder table with the symbols of mourning and loss to remind us that we need to keep working to get hostages out, that we need to keep working to stand in solidarity with all of our brothers and sisters, that symbol side by side with the symbol of the mourning, the deaths of others, because all humans are made in the image of God, this is the best way that I can think of to encompass the myriad emotions, beliefs, and values that I hold inside me this year. So for all of us, it's only a few days away, I know, but there is time to think about this and find some symbols. Get a mirror for your table. Find an orange to put out. Giant might be out of kosher pasta or cream cheese, but it's not out of oranges as of Friday. <laughs> Reduce the matzah that you have. Reduce our joy. Put out a splash guard to hold the extra drops of wine that we will spill on our tables this year. But we have to find something that we can do because this year is not a normal year and our Seder should reflect that. It should not be a normal year. So I leave you with questions. What do you need this year? What do you need to be reminded of? How can your Seder table reflect your values, your power, and what you want to teach to our children? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.